So, Herta, we're delighted to have you at Impact Executive's annual lecture. Um, you've had a fascinating career that's taken you from the very heights of investment banking into your current role, which focuses on sustainable investment in Africa. That's right. And along the way, led 28 people to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, seven of which were disabled. Um, so, lots to talk about, I think it would yes. be fair to say. Yes. Um, first of all, what prompted your move out of big global corporate business into your current role? I had a very, very good run in investment banking and I left at the top of my game after building and running structured finance businesses, but I really felt I wanted to do something else with the next phase of my career and that was to have a fundamental impact uh, on primarily alleviation of poverty. It, I kept asking the question, what are the consumer-led growth industries that are at the core of poverty alleviation that we as private sector investors can invest in? And that really f catapulted me into, into doing what I'm doing now, which is to run Aria Capital and uh, facilitate investments into primarily sub-Saharan Africa. Sure. Herta, tell me about the Kilimanjaro trip. What prompted it? Uh, the first one or the second one? Well, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the first one was simply, I saw Kilimanjaro, we were on safari, and I saw Kilimanjaro, and I said to my husband, I want to climb that for my 40th birthday. I was absolutely mesmerized with this incredibly beautiful mountain. And the first attempt to summit Kilimanjaro was an unmitigated failure. Um, and so for me, that was really unfinished business. The second, uh, attempt to summit uh, was really motivated by a number of factors. Uh, I was involved with a charity, a beautiful disability charity called Enum, where my, uh, a good friend of mine was chairman at the time, and we really felt we needed to raise the profile of the charity. So I had this brilliant idea that I would climb Mount Kilimanjaro for my 50th birthday and, uh, and actually take a group of disabled and non-disabled climbers with me. And it was really the, the idea of creating a buddy system that uh, we would have each disabled climber actually buddied with one or two non-disabled climbers depending on the disability of, of the climbers. And so we ended up with seven disabled climbers, six from the UK, one from Saudi Arabia and uh, together we summited Kilimanjaro. What obstacles, obviously there's a long list of obvious obstacles, but were there any major obstacles that you had to overcome? Uh, very, very much so, because I really wanted to show through this expedition that everybody's entitled to his or her dream and that we can do a lot more together than any one of us separately. And so I wanted to capture this in, in film because there's nothing like visual effects, if, if you will, to, to show a thesis, to demonstrate a point that, that, you, that you want to make. And so this became an incredibly complex expedition. Not only did we have a regulated charity involved and, and the need to keep the trustees on site, keep, uh, manage the financial implications and, and so forth, but also managing a complex film crew, managing the people issues involved, making sure that everybody was buddied correctly. Uh, so there were a whole, a whole host of issues from uh, just keeping everybody focused on the vision to, to having the right people in the right chairs, if, if you will. And what did you personally learn about leadership? Um, I thought I was a pretty effective leader before, um, and certainly one of the things that I learned without apology is that if you really want to, s to test your mettle uh, as a leader, lead a group of volunteers, because leading volunteers is the most leadership-intensive exercise under the sun, because if you think about it logically, you don't have a carrot, you don't have a stick, and so you really have to motivate people uh, in terms of their intrinsic values, what they, what they actually want to achieve out of this. And so it, I, I learned so much and uh, as a result I really felt, uh, particularly when, the, uh, when we had the major financial crisis in, in September of 2008 and that really continues in different forms, that I actually had something to say on this whole subject of leadership from resilience to failing to how to deal with failure, how to deal with criticism, how to keep your winning team strong, uh, and then last but not least, don't stay too long at the top. Herta, you're an expert on the African markets. Um, how do you see Africa evolving in the future? Africa 
to many people is still the dark continent and it is uh, often people think of Africa as a country uh, it is not it is a very complex continent with 54 countries and uh, challenging demographics. Uh, it, it's going to be the only continent on Earth where the population is going to double from a billion to two billion people. So, uh, but it's also the continent that has the largest natural resources and 20% of the world's arable land. So if we really think about the major security issues that we are facing as a planet, such as food, energy, water, uh, Africa has a solution to those major security issues. And so I am an optimist about Africa, uh, but I think its future will very much depend on how much money flows into Africa in terms of strategic investments into those key sectors, as well as African leadership. Uh, I think everything rises and falls on leadership. And this continent has been challenged when it comes to constructive, effective leaders. There are not many, and I think there has to be a leadership shift and a, a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of how, how these countries are led. So optimistic about the continent, but I think uh, it, it, there's a fundamental leadership challenge in, in the various countries that we operate in. What, in your opinion, is the most important skill or character trait um, when leading change through tough times? I mean, I would say, first of all, resilience. It's you have to have the ability to bounce back, to reinvent yourself, to, uh, to find different ways of, of doing things. And, and right now, we are particularly faced with enormous crises, whether they are of a financial nature, political, but at the end of the day, really leadership crisis. And so I think resilience is incredibly important. I think you also have to keep the faith that things are going to get better, because otherwise we give up. Um, but you have to have the faith that, that things are going to get better. And there is always opportunity in chaos. So I think the ability to actually see the opportunities when everything seems to be upside down, um, those, I would, I would say, are the key, key traits. There are obviously many others that augment those, but, uh, but if I had to choose the top three, I would say, you know, resilience, you have to hang in there, see opportunity in chaos, and keep the faith. Hata, thank you so much for your time this evening. Your book, The Mountain Within, is published by McGraw-Hill. Yes. It's available at all good bookstores and, of course, on Amazon. Yes. Um, thank you so much for giving your time. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.